Archon 888 back with part two of our presentation, Pawnee, Canadian Indigenous Slavery in Canada, from 1867 into the 1970s. Uh, if you watched part one, then you know how they treated the kids in the Indian residential schools if they ran away. Beat him like a runaway. I can't say it because I isn't one. But, uh, yeah, we're continuing to stream this presentation live on the Theta TV Edge node. And... Something in a language that I did not understand. When I told her in Cree that I did not understand her words, she slapped my face and yelled at me. When I again attempted to tell her in Cree that I did not understand, she slapped me again. I was so scared that I did not cry and marched like the other girls to the dining hall where we had oatmeal porridge with molasses, but no milk. No milk at this I wasn't very hungry. That morning, I learned my first lesson on how to survive this place. Never say anything when being punished. Shubhanagadi at first was supposed to set up, be set up to be self-sustaining. It would produce their own meat, their own vegetables, their fruits. You know, they had cows, they had pigs, they had gardens, they had apple orchards. You know, Think about it. Who tended those orchards? You know, I was, my cousin Ernest worked at the piggery. And he was telling me, he says, Clark, thinking back, you know, one day we butchered 11 pigs. <coughs> thinking that we were going to eat good. When he went down to the piggery to go back to work the next day, thinking he was going to cut up the meat and all that, all the pigs were gone during the night. The priest had the butcher from town come and get, get all the meat. And he took him down to his shop. Now, the priest told the butcher what he wanted for himself and for the nuns. So the butcher cut it up, delivered it, and the rest was for his shop. Now, what he couldn't sell in his shop, he put into a box and sent it back to the school. Now, I, I want you to think about that. You slaughter 11 pigs and you, you send them out to the butcher. And he charges you, what, 10 pigs? To get a pig worth of meat back for yourself? Y you think that's what's going on here? Or, or do you think that maybe that meat was being sold on consignment? For us to eat. This is what was made into part of our diet. The rotten scraps. You know, a lot of the meat by the time he got back it was starting to spoil and ruin because he'd been in his shop so long because and when he couldn't sell it he just sent it back and waited for the next batch the fall of 1965 when the indian affairs branch asked a number of its indigenous employees to reflect upon their experiences as former residential school students one of these employees was a man by the name of Russell Moses, an Air Force veteran and a member of the Delaware Band of the Six Nations of Grand River. Between 1942 and 1947, Moses attended the Mush Hole, 
a name that he and other students had used to refer to the notorious Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Ontario. This residential school had opened in the 1830s as one of Canada's first Indian residential schools, and it would remain open until 1970. So it was the longest running residential school in Canadian history. Now Moses in his report was blunt <clears throat> about his residential school experience. And I want to put this picture of Moses up uh, with his sister. This is the year that he would have entered residential schools. And I think it's important for you to look at this picture and think about all the things I'm going to be telling you today were happening to children, young children this age. If any of you have children, I want you to, I want you to start to think about this, um, you know, that this was done to children. When I was asked to do this paper, I had some misgivings, Moses wrote. For if I were to be honest, I must tell of things how they were. And really, he added, this is not my story, but yours. Now, the story he tells in his memoir is one of uh, a harrowing one, of constant abuse and mistreatment. Food, it turned out, was a central part of this abuse. And so it plays a prominent role in Moses' report. And this is a report, I should add, that was first brought to my attention by Moses' son, John, uh, and which I am presenting today with the family's blessing. The food at the Institute, Moses wrote, was disgraceful, and I'm quoting from his memoir here. For breakfast, students were given two slices of bread with either jam or honey as the dressing, oatmeal with worms, or cornmeal porridge, which was minimum, minimal in quantity and appalling in quality. You will eat the bugs. The beverage, he added, consisted of skim milk, and when one stops to consider that we were milking from 20 to 30 head of purebred Holstein cattle, it seems odd that we do not ever receive whole milk in my five years at the school, and we never once receive butter. Now, I'm a little bit of a farm boy, and I at least know what to look up online. A Holstein cow will produce nine gallons of fresh moo juice each day. If you've got 20 head of Holstein, we're talking 180 gallons of milk, fresh from the cow, stronger than the whole milk you buy in the store. If you want to talk about a school with, say, 120 kids, that would be a gallon and a half of milk per child per day. And you know what they get? A little enamel cup of skim milk. Where was all that milk going? You think it was being poured down the drain or you think someone was selling it? Lunch turned out to be no better, and I quote, At the Institute, this consisted of water as a beverage. If you were a senior boy or girl, you received one and a half slices of dry bread, and the main course consisted of a rotten soup made of scraps of beef and vegetables, some in a state of decay. Children under the grade five level for their part received one slice of dry bread for lunch. Incidentally, he added, we were not Weight Watchers. And finally, for supper, Moses recalled, this consisted of two slices of bread and jam, fried potatoes, no meat, a bun baked by the girls, and every other night a piece of cake or possibly an apple in the summer months. The diet remained constant, Moses stressed, and hunger was never absent. In his 1965 report, he estimated that 90% of the children when he was going to the school were suffering from some form of malnutrition, and he even recalled, quote, children eating from the swill barrel, picking out soggy bits of food that was intended for the pigs. Now, as it turns out, the Mohawk Institute wasn't part of the nutrition experiments I'll be discussing today though it was initially included on a potential list of schools uh, that they were going to include in the experiments because of the poor quality of the diet uh, that Moses describes. Take, for instance, the testimony of Ray Silver, a survivor of the Alberni Indian Residential School. And I'm quoting only from published accounts uh, of residential school survivor. I've heard, you know, dozens and dozens of accounts as, I, as I've traveled across the country. Silver told the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada that he remembered being reduced to scavenging through garbage in order to get enough to eat. And us kids, Silver told the TRC, 
We used to sneak from the school. We must have had to walk about a mile, sneak away from the school, sneak over the bridge and go to that dump and pick up apples. They were half rotten or something. They are no more good to sell, but us kids, we were starving. We'd go there and pick that stuff up, fill our shirts and run back across the, across the bridge and go back to school. The story is collected by Mi'kmaq writer and Shubenacadie Residential School survivor Isabel Knockwood about her and her fellow students' experiences at the school, paint a really similar picture to this other school on the entire other side of the country. And she talks about survivors with, quote, vivid memories of being constantly hungry. As Knockwood writes about her own experience at the school between 1936 and 1947, just one year before these experiments began, the children were often forced to serve gourmet meals on fancy porcelain dishes to the nuns and priests. Well, she and the other children were instead forced to subsist on, quote, potatoes that were often rotten and rancid meat from enamel tin plates. Now, the extent to which these and other accounts of hunger are common across the entire map of Canada, throughout the entire history of the residential school system, led one of the leading historians of the residential school systems, J.R. Miller, to remark in his 1996 uh, book, Shingwalk's Vision, quote, we were always hungry could serve as a slogan for any organization of former residential school students. And troubling theme of the letters was that many children wanted to reassure the doctors letters that the examinations to the doctors were not in the painful. experiment. One child, for instance, wrote, quote, the pokes I got me didn't hurt very much, and I got a couple of my teeth out by the dentist, but it didn't hurt very much when he pulled them out. Listen to this. And to give you some context for that statement, I've talked to survivors of the Alberni Residential School. And the dentists at this time, and, and in fact for decades afterwards, were pulling teeth out without anesthetic. Um, and so when a child says that it didn't hurt very much, I think we can read between the lines. Um, captures the main reason why these horrific experiences happened was because the federal government refused to pay uh, sufficient money to dentists to, to help these kids. Kids who were wards of the state, Dentists got paid more money for an extraction than for a filling. They didn't get paid for uh, an using anesthetics, so they didn't. And this is a legacy that people continue to have to this day. In an email about their own experience during the 1940s, quote, even today, I still cannot ease my feelings of hunger. Now, as you might imagine, with all this hunger being described, Students and parents were not silent in the face of the awful conditions in residential schools. In fact, the archives are filled with letters and petitions from Indigenous parents arguing that their children were hungry and sick because of the poor quality of food being served in schools. For most of the first 60 years of the residential school system, though, the pleas fell on deaf ears. The result was that the Canadian government proved unwilling to admit that hunger and malnutrition in residential schools was a serious problem until during the 1940s, around the end of the Second World War, when there's question of this what's man, genocide, who's committing Federal it? Federal Nutrition Division Director Lionel Pett, uh, who happened to also be the author of the first ever Canada's Food Guide. Remember him from video one? He launched a series of investigations into food services and federally operated facilities like prisons, wartime munition factories, and Indian residential schools. So they're federal installations? For the residential schools, he sought the assistance of Red Cross dietitians to help with, the, with his nutritional investigations. And here's a, one of those dietitians in, at the Shubenacadie Residential School in 1948. When they began to investigate schools, it became clear that the conditions at the schools were extremely troubling. In fact, nearly without exception, I've read all the reports, and in every part of the country, the food in the schools failed to meet the government's own basic stated requirements for vitamins, minerals, protein, and in many schools, even calories. At most schools, children were never allowed second helpings, no matter how hungry they were. And so-called protective food like meat, milk, fruits, and vegetables were a rarity. In fact, I should add here that these reports, as I was reading them, it became clear that they were letting the schools know in, in advance they were coming. And so the, what they were seeing was not actually the, what was being fed to the students. It was, you know, what they wanted an inspector to see them being fed to the students. So the fact that they were still totally inadequate diets shows just how bad it was. <laughs> the inspectors also found that in addition to serving insufficient quantities of food, 
Schools often lacked a trained cooking staff. In fact, many lacked even rudimentary appliances, like a refrigerator. Uh, most failed to meet basic standards of sanitation. More important though, and even where there was an experienced kitchen staff, which is in fact quite rare, uh, because salaries were so low, there were rarely sufficient funds to actually purchase nutritious foods. In fact, based on Lionel Pett's own calculations, the per capita grant provided for food in most schools was often half that required to maintain a balanced and nutritionally adequate diet. And where'd the money come from? Well, we'll find out about that in the next video.